Hello, my friends. This is Andy over at Falco Canine Academy. I am so happy to be here with you. Um, I just decided that um, I should look and make sure that I set up this right. This is the first time I've gone this late on a Sunday night to do a Facebook Live. Um, what I want to do is, um, as any business does, you know, you start, you experiment with a few things here and there. And you just kind of want to see when people are available. Uh, and I know that, um, oh, good. Yeah. So there it is, right there. Um, so I just want to make sure that I actually did it right because I, for some reason at the last minute, when you were in high school, uh, did you ever play that game with your friends? You'd be walking home from school and say, hey, did you lock your locker? And then you go, oh, I don't remember if I locked my locker. And then you'd have to walk all the way back to make sure you locked your locker. Well, that's kind of what I just did to myself. I said, did I post this to the right Facebook page? Uh, and I, I just noticed that I did. So what we're going to be talking about is uh, the number two question that we get. Uh, and it's not really in that order, as a matter of fact, in, in, in regard to the popularity of the frequently asked question, but it's just in the list of things that I've written down. It's my number two uh, in regard to what we get asked, what style or what technique or what, um, uh, what else is it called? It's called different kinds of things. People ask us about how we train dogs and uh, what is it we use to train a dog. Uh, the first one we did is what kind of collar do we recommend? And that can seem like it's the same thing, but really it's not. So we're going to go through and I'm going to name some of the types of training that people mention. Some of them are actually the same, but have different words. And um and we're going to go through a couple things. And some are they get very confused uh, by one another. One person thinks that this particular type of training or style of training is very much like this other style of training or explanation of training. And so I'm going to go through a couple of them and just try to make sure that we visit some of them. Uh, and then I'll give you Falco Canine Academy's, uh, uh, I guess, philosophy or style or whatever you want to call it, uh, which is kind of like our callers. What you're going to find out in a, in a moment is... Um, uh, anyway, let me just get to that point. But let me tell you about a couple things that are coming up. I've been very fortunate that to have been asked uh, to be a part of um, the first annual online summit uh, for animal wellness. And it's, so it's called the Animal Wellness Summit. And it's coming up November 10th through the 20th, and it's free. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put the link for you to register. And all you need to do is put your name uh, first name, last name, and your email address uh, into this uh, uh, landing page uh, that I'm going to give you. And um, it is, oh man, I just had all the information here. You'll learn, oh, it's for 10 days. You'll learn for 10 days straight all online from the comfort of your home from 50 plus passionate experts dedicated to horses, dogs, and cats. And so um, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure they probably have some type of, um, um, what do you call it? Like a, um, <laughs> a format, maybe, uh, they'll have some type of format. Maybe they'll, they'll email out as to what's happening on what day and that kind of stuff. So I've just put in the comment section. So just make sure you register, put your name in there. It's not, they're not going to uh, spam you. Um, they just want to make sure that you're registered so that you can get the proper links so that you can have them for each uh, you know, training session that's gonna occur over that 10 day period, all right? So that's what that is to get you. So um, you'll learn for 10 days straight, uh, all online from uh, 50, I didn't know. I was, I'm one of 50 um, passionate experts that are gonna be talking. I'm, I'm gonna be recording one of those after I get off of uh, this particular broadcast on Facebook Live. Uh, and you just simply need to register, just register and uh, like I said, I am not sure exactly how you're going to know what thing they're doing on each day, but I'm sure there's going to be something there. You're probably a website you're going to be able to go to um, and you'll be able to find out what they're going to be talking about on each day so that you can know whether it's going to be horses or, you know, does it have to do with uh, nutrition? Does it have to do with exercise? Does it have to do with uh, um, uh, essential oils? Does it have to do with, you know, uh, vaccines and that kind of stuff? And so uh, what I'm understanding is that it's the wellness summit. It's going to be talking about anything and everything about the wellness of animals. Uh, particularly uh, horses, dogs, and cats. All right, so uh, there is that. And I also want to always make sure input for those people that are visiting us for the first time and just want a, um, a paper uh, that uh, I make available. It's for training your dog with love and respect. That might be a hint as to what style of training um, we, <laughs> we feature here at Falco Canyon Academy, uh, but it probably needs a little bit more explanation. Uh, and so there is that, so there's that link and, uh, same thing, just put your name and email address, uh, and I'll send you in an email, the, uh, paper 
for uh, training your dog with love and respect. And there's a, a book uh, that I'm writing, uh, that's already been actually uh, pre-released. Uh, I wouldn't get it yet because I've not finished uh, putting everything in there that I want to put in there. As a matter of fact, somebody reviewed it and said, this doesn't look like it has everything in it. No, it doesn't. Um, there's just a, a way of getting it up and uh, onto Amazon so that when it does go live, that, um, we hit the ground running. So anyway, don't go there right now. This is the white paper. Go through the white paper. You'll see. And then I'll let you know when the book is live uh, for sure. And has all the information in there. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about some styles of training and, and get through those because the list is actually kind of long that I have here. It's actually about uh, 10, 10 that I've written down. And uh, a couple of them are simply uh, the same type of training, but with a different name. And so you'll see that as we go. And so one of the first ones that uh, you can find by doing uh, a Google search is alpha dog or dominance type of training where uh, it's kind of the, the Caesar Milan, I guess he, he wouldn't mind uh, if I said that, uh, that, you know, you, you have to show a dog who's boss kind of thing. And, I, and that is really not um, something that I uh, propose. Uh, it, it's dangerous to kind of think that way, especially when you get a dog who is uh, struggling with um, uh, some type of rank uh, drive, uh, and does in, uh, in genetics and you try to alpha dog, that kind of dog. And you're going to find yourself because most people can't do it <laughs> and, uh, they get into trouble and I've seen it. Right. And so, um, it is just not recommended. You can do it to a dog who's a rather weak and now you've ruined the relationship between you and your dog. And you really have to know what you're doing. There's many training techniques and styles that are really made or really, best utilized by professionals. And when you teach somebody, and this is what the unfortunate thing about dog trainers is they go, well, this is, I works for me. So obviously when I teach it to somebody else, they're going to be able to do it. Well, no, that person you're teaching is not a dog trainer. They are a pet owner who doesn't have time to be a dog trainer. They just want their dog to stop doing whatever, right? Running down the road and not coming back when they call it. Uh, they want the dog to be obedient, not pull them down the, uh, the street uh, and drag them on their face. And so those people that we are helping are customers and clients um, although a technique or a, an alpha style or dominant style of training would probably work for us with in regard to many dogs, rarely works for a person who is a, um, a housewife, a, a teacher, uh, an attorney. Uh, and that's what they do for them. They're not a dog trainer. And their their idea of timing is just that they just want it done, <laughs> right? Uh, and their, their timing in regard to dog training is blah, and it's not there. And so and that obviously is a really important thing. So that's one style that you'll get. And if you hear somebody talk about that and you have a dog and they're trying to teach you that, I would probably uh, run, not walk to the exit. So, um, and I, I do have some opinions on this. So, and that's one of them. Um, that is just not one. Now, have I ever done that with a dog? Absolutely. I've had dogs try to eat me and I have to actually defend myself and put myself in a position of dominance over a dog. But again, I've been doing it for 30 years and I've dealt with thousands of police dogs and a number of them have tried to eat me uh, inappropriately at the wrong time. And so um, I've uh, had, to, had to pick up on that skill to uh, protect myself and dominate a dog to get the dog to back off. Uh, I got caught in a kennel with a dog once with the door shut and uh, the dog leaped over uh, the dog house or it was what had gone in there said the dog house um, and leapt over the dog house and grabbed me in midair as I put my arm up to protect myself, he would have got me in the face if I didn't. And the dog tried to pull me down to the ground and uh, take me out. Um, I survived, the dog survived and the dog went on to be fine after that. But um, not many people would have known what to do. In, and it was in the dark, in the kennel, in my backyard. And it was pretty awesome. All right, so, and then we have our purely positive folks. And there's many of you uh, purely positive and that is fine, but I don't know anybody that is truly purely purely positive. And I know that's a, a word that's thrown around. I know there's books that are called purely positive. Uh, and I can honestly say many of the trainers, many of the professional trainers I've been around who have written books or papers or blogs that, <laughs> that say they're purely positive. I know them and they, it's not purely positive. There, there is a moment, even they will acknowledge in private with somebody they can trust that they have had to give a dog a correction and tell the dog, no, uh, withholding a food from a dog is not positive, right? Uh, actually food reward training can be the most stressful type of training for an animal. Uh, there's a trainer in Florida and he will starve dogs for a week 
He's really well known. He's been on television. Uh, I'm not going to say his name, but he charges thousands and thousands of dollars. And I know people that have sued him because he's nearly killed their dogs because he starves them for too long um, and withhold, withholds the food. And so, um, and claims that he it's a positive training. It's not. It's stressful. It's harmful. It's bad. Um, and so, uh, there you go. Now, there is some purely positive in the sense that you do as much as you can where you only look for the dog to do the right thing and you reward the dog, right? You give the dog a treat. Now, the dog's never been withheld food uh, and the dog just like a Labrador retriever. Like, you could fed the dog and still do food training. That's fine. Um, I had a dog named Ace at Anaheim Police Department. I uh, bought the dog at 10 months old from uh, Canada. Uh, I uh, called my chief of police at Anaheim Police Department and said, hey, I got this dog. The dog's fantastic. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, we need to buy the dog now. I know we don't have a handler for the dog, but I'm going to train the dog. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to see, because I was already testing, uh, taking out many of the harmful uh, training methods that I was trained with a stick and electric electronic prod, um, the old electronic collar style of just shocking the dog until he submitted. And that's how we were all taught and trained. And so I was already leaving that realm and was moving more into a more positive type of training and positive reinforcement training, not purely positive. There's a big difference, uh, positive training, uh, positive reinforcement. And I said, you know, while we're waiting for somebody, it's not going to hurt the dog for me to try to do this. And I went through a uh, a, a, what I tried to do as purely as possible, positive reinforcement training. And it was fantastic. The dog was outstanding. And it was my first, um, the light bulb came on and said, oh my God, dogs work harder when they do it for a positive reason. Up to that point, we were training police dogs that if they didn't do it, they'd get their ass kicked. If they didn't let go, they'd get their ass kicked. If they didn't search hard, they'd get their ass kicked. If they didn't bite hard enough, they'd get their ass kicked. But now I was doing it for the other reasons, right? The dog did it and the dog got a reward. I'd give the dog a toy. People thought I was crazy. They thought I was the antichrist in the police world. They thought I was an idiot and a moron. And they go, you can never give a dog a toy in police dog training. You can never give a dog a food in, in, dog, in police dog training. You'll ruin the dog. No, you should have seen this dog. The dog was outstanding. Uh, by the time I gave it to the handler, the dog had, had not been corrected in I don't know how long. I mean, really had not been corrected. The dog was responding almost always and in, in, in exclusively to some type of positive reinforcement. I'm not going to say it was purely positive because I withheld certain things for a period of time. The toy the, for the dog, not food, but the toy withheld the toy, which is negative, which you'll see later on when we talk about another type of training. Right. And so uh, I would also give the dog a timeout. I would say, oh, you didn't perform. I take the dog and put him in a crate, shut the crate door wait 30 minutes, an hour, bring the dog back out and do it again. The dog didn't do it. I put him back in the crate for an hour. The dog come out and I, then the dog would do it. Oh, I give the dog the toy. All right. In the, in the sense that I didn't use a leash correction or a pinch collar or an electronic collar on that dog. He only had a flat collar on and had nothing else and went to a purely, a, a mostly positive, I almost said it, a mostly positive reinforcement training. The dog was fantastic. Ace was fantastic. As you're coming on, and I can see you're on, uh, you know, it's so funny. There are 200 people that watched the the last uh, Facebook Live that I did live, and I had one, maybe I think one person commented the entire time. Would you please comment? I can see that you're watching. Uh, and to just put your name in there and tell me where you're from as, you, as you're going along and say hi. That way I know that you're coming along. And ask questions, right? Ask questions about what it is we're talking about. And I'll do my best to answer. I don't know all of these training uh, words or training, uh, uh, th these training styles intimately but i know them well right and so you may stop me with a question and i'll say you know i don't know I'll, but i'll tell you in the next broadcast if i find out but ask me a question um and um uh, or say you know what you're absolutely right i've seen that too all right so ace uh, uh was a great police dog it, it was he was probably the uh the dog that really changed the way that i trained dogs uh, got rid of all the sticks got rid of all the uh, other uh, horrible types of training uh, tools that I was given uh, to train dogs at that time and went in completely a different direction than the rest of the industry. Completely different. You are, you would be shocked at how many people are doing training now differently, I think, because of what we were able to do at Anaheim Police Department with the dogs. So, all right, the next one is um, scientific training. Uh, and that one's a little difficult. Um, it, I, I've come across it a couple times and it's really the scientific aspect of looking at training and going deep into the dog's brain and uh, use an operant in, in, in classical conditioning in a way that's more scientific uh, and that kind of stuff. And it gets really convoluted and it's, it's, it's not for pet dog trainers. <laughs> Just know that. Now, there are some pet dog trainers that want to know that kind of stuff and do that. That is fantastic. Go deep, 
go deep in your understanding of dog training and really understand the dog's psyche and brains and intelligence and 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 the fact that they're in in some cases not intelligent or they're just responding to stimulus right and so uh, it's great i uh, was a part of a, a couple different scientific papers one of them at uc davis where i wrote a published uh, scientific paper on set detection dogs and was very proud of that uh, that 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 happening and so uh, again it's a technique i guess and i guess it, when you type dog training techniques, it comes up, uh, but it's it's definitely one that I've been involved in, but it's not something necessarily for pet dogs. All right, so that is another one. Uh, uh, another one that's very popular is clicker training, and I think it's it's good, it's great, it's fun. It's not for everybody, and it's not, for tr it's not necessarily for the pet dog owner who's coming to us looking for us to solve the problem. When Sally Frost came to our training place, and she, I've told this story several times, her shirt was kind of, you know, cockeyed and her arms had some scratch marks on it. Her bra strap was kind of, <laughs> her hair was messed up and she's going, I need help with my dog. <laughs> Am I in the right place? She had this big Newfoundland uh, that was uh, just running her life and uh, she was not happy. And uh, and so uh, we made a difference. She's been a raving fan of ours for a long time. Uh, I, I call her uh, my avatar, my perfect customer. That's where uh, you, as a business owner, you mark, you um, create your marketing around your perfect customer. And she's the one that I look at as our perfect customer because she came to us with a problem, right? With a pain and we solved that pain and it wasn't through clicker training. <laughs> now, uh, she's at a point now that she would love to learn some clicker, clicker training and we did some later on in regard to teaching her dog how to hold onto a rope because it's a Newfoundland and she wanted the dog to go into the water and grab a rope and pull a boat into the shore. And that was in that part, we got to the clicker training part. All right, clicker training is great, but it's not necessarily for problem solving for people to come to us with big problems with their dogs and say, please help me. I'm, I'm gonna get rid of this dog if, um, if we don't do something. They're typically not in the space mentally to go through a clicker training training, all right? Because it takes patience, it takes timing, it takes understanding, and there's a lot more to people just say, just fix my dog. Just get my dog to stop, please. I wanna get rid of this dog. I have a love, hate. I love my dog, but I hate my dog and I wanna shoot it half the time. Do you find uh, you train the handler more than the dog? Yes, uh, Austin, our training, our, you may have seen our, uh, our, on my side of my truck, it says human training for your dog. That is our uh, tagline, human training for your dog, because it's not about the dog. The dog is super easy. Uh, it's the human beings that can be a little bit difficult. And so here we come back to clicker training. Clicker training is a great method of training, but it's not necessarily for the human. Humans uh, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis don't want to learn how to be dog trainers. They just want their dog fixed, right? And so we have to trick them because it has to be about the human being in the end. Austin, you're right. It has to be about them, but we trick them. Where you say, oh, welcome to our dog training. We're going to help you with your dog. Um, and then we secretly and slowly indoctrinate them into understanding that this is what they have to do now with this dog. You can't train this dog like they did their past dog or the dog that they were the kid or way the train or the, the neighbor trains his dog because that's who's you they get help from, right? The neighbor who has a dog who's perfect to say, like, how'd you get a dog to be perfect? Well, you need to do this, this, and this. Well, that, that works for their dog. It doesn't work for your dog, right? And so we then have to help them with their dog. So thank you, Austin. Yes, for that question. I really appreciate that. Um, and so... Yeah, and so the, the human in regard to clicker training, great training method. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that that clicker training, I, I think. If I forget, maybe if somebody remembers, hey, you're gonna talk about, so go a little bit deeper on that clicker training on, on something that uh, happened with us at Falco Canine Academy, which is kind of interesting considering, uh, and it has to do with detection dogs, just so you know, come, we'll come back to that. All right, uh, electronic training, um, which is electronic collars. Um, you also have invisible fences. And as a police dog, uh, handler my dog was shocked with a cattle prod to get him to do stuff so i would say that's all uh, electronic but there is a method of using an electronic collar with a remote and then the, uh, the, the as the transmitter and the receiver be, being the collar where that actually can be a very humane way of training and a very effective way of training and so but you have to know how to do it right and we're going to get into um classical conditioning in just a little bit and that's a little bit of what it is that we uh, are going to be um, uh, uh, talking about uh, operant conditioning and classical conditioning. So operant conditioning is how we start with the electronic color and then some classical conditioning gets going on after that. So anyway, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. All right. Um, 
but it can be effective way of training. Is it our primary way of training? No, but it is a method that we do know how to do and can do. All right, uh, my, uh, model uh, rival or mirror training. I actually had a video that I was gonna show you, but it's about uh, seven or eight minutes long and I might show it at another time. Uh, on one of my other broadcasts, but uh, it, it is the, it is the, another human being. So you're the handler with the dog and another human being does what the dog is supposed to do. And the dog will end up modeling that. And that, again, that can be difficult. <laughs> There's a lot of people that need to be involved. The other person needs to be good at what they do and that kind of stuff. And if it's the other trainer trying to help you do it and that kind of stuff, that has to happen. Plus the handler has to have their training down and has to understand what it is the other person is doing. So can it work? Yes. Um, it also uh, works for other dogs. Dog, your dog can train another dog in your house and it happens all the time. More often than not, it's the bad behaviors dogs learn from the other dog, right? Uh, they don't always learn the good behaviors. Uh, in police dog training, uh, we'll bring out all the veteran dogs to do bite work and we'll bring out the new rookie dog to watch the older dogs do bite work. And that works really well. It actually makes the younger dog try harder and work harder and actually actually does work. And so it's modeling. Uh, again, it works in some aspects, but it's not really in the sense that, it's, again, I, I'm going to go back to this one area where I, these questions are coming from a place. If you're a pet dog owner that has a problem with their dog, is this something that you're going to you'd use when you come to somebody's training. If they, if they say, well, what do you do model, uh, model uh, rival or mirror training? You go, okay, uh, yeah, but can you fix my dog? Uh, again, everybody has to be on the same page uh, with that and you have to be very, um, uh, very willing to be a part of that kind of training and it, it can take a little bit of work. Again, we've seen it uh, and in our own training, we, the, the, the part of group training is that the other dogs will see the other dogs doing something well and we'll actually have dogs sit and watch while another dog gets tons of praise. And again, use that kind of in a method to show the other dog, hey, if you do that too, you can get that much praise too, right? And so we have done that in our training and it, and it actually works pretty well. Uh, Relationship-based training. And we're getting a little bit closer to Falco Canine Academy's uh, uh, at philosophy and training. And that is, it's really based on the relationship between the human and the dog and then building on that relationship. And that's kind of where we're at on this training, but it came up a couple of times in my search and uh, the way that I was reading it, that they had, it, it was not quite what we were talking about, but pretty close. All right. So that's, uh, that's a good one though. I, I would say I would be more uh, apt to do something like that. If people do understand that the relation, but that a dog human uh, living in the same home is a relationship and it needs to be treated as a relationship is very important. It needs to be understood and it needs to be taught and it needs to be approached from that point of view. Uh, it's like, um, uh, you know, uh, husband and wife A going to the counselor and then husband and wife B comes in and goes in the counselor. Is the counselor going to treat and, and treat the same um, using the same techniques with couple A as they do with couple B? No, because it may be different. The, the woman and, and couple A may be the dominant one. The man may be the, the, the weaker of the two sexes. And then you have a couple uh, B where it's the other way around, right? And so the technique used may not be the same, but it's still relational. And you're still trying to work on the relationship between the two. And so that's where you'll have, you know, the importance that the, the counselor knows what they're doing. Right. If you if they're trying to treat everybody the same way, then they're not going to be in business very long because they're going to be very narrow in what it is they in their scope and what it is they can do. Uh, all right. Now we're going to get. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. After that, uh, the Kohler method, you hear a lot about because mostly because there's books written about the Kohler method written by I think his name is Bill Kohler. I always forget his name, <clears throat> but it has to do with a combination of, uh, of opera conditioning, classical conditioning and some other stuff throw in there. It's also known, I think, sometimes. Uh, people have uh, brought the uh, idea that there's some har harshness, sorry, where'd my voice go? Harshness in that type of training. <clears throat> and so it's looked at as, mm, it's a little, we're getting on that little bit of harshness, that little alpha, but with operant and classical thrown in there kind of stuff. And I, I think it's a method that's been around for a very, very long time and seems to work. You just got to be careful that you're with the right people that, you know, are a little bit more understanding of the relationship between the dog and the hand. All right. So now I'll, oops, I didn't even put that one up there. Kohler. So that way you know what to look up. Kohler method. All right. So you can find that. All right. So the next one is, I might've missed an E in there. Let me look back at that again. Kohler. I think it might be K-O-E. Is it? I can't remember. If anybody knows, let me know. <laughs> All right. Uh, operant conditioning. So we got operant conditioning and I'm going to throw up uh, uh, classical conditioning. Those, these two get often get confused, operant and classical. Oh, I got the nine in there, but not in, not in this one. All right. They often get confused. 
So let me show you. I'm going to share my screen here. Oop, I didn't do that already. I should have this already set up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And up to broadcast. There we go. Make myself small. All right. So operant conditioning is a type of learning where behavior is controlled by consequences. Key concepts in operant conditioning are positive reinforcement, which is reward, negative reinforcement, which is escape, positive punishment, which is like a spanking or striking, and negative punishment, which is kind of a timeout. So let's go through these things really quick. And this is where it gets really confusing and people have no idea what it is they're talking about and they get so lost. So uh, really easy, positive reinforcement is simply a reward. If you know, a piece of food, a treat, uh, a, a toy. When the dog does the right thing, the dog sits and you give the dog a treat. The dog downs and you give the dog a treat. The dog lays down. Again, you throw the ball and the dog gets the uh, toy. Petting the dog is a positive reward, right? Those are all positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is escape. And this is the way that electronic collar actually should be used. So this is what makes electronic collar different. Electronic collar, oops, let me get rid of this so that I, mean, I know you have to see me, <laughs> but no. So um, escape negative reinforcement is you are applying some negativity until the dog does what you want and then you release the negativity, all right? So in the case of an electronic collar, I'm gonna go ahead and come back to my, uh, my full screen here. In the case of electronic collar, the best way to use this, and I know that I'm gonna upset some of the other people that do some of the other type of training with electronic collars, but I have found <laughs> the best way of using this is that, whoa, my TV just went off. Uh, hold on, where's my mute? There we go. Um, and so um, in, the, in the very first stages of train electronic call, you have the dog on a long line, uh, in, in many cases, a retractable. And uh, you have the, uh, the very low stimulation uh, of the electronic collar. So like at a two where it's given electronic stimulus to the neck and you push the button, you push the button at the time, moment you push the button, the dog goes, hey, what is that feeling? I don't like that feeling. And you say here, and then what you do is you pull the dog towards you. And then when the dog reaches you, you stop the electrical pulse. All right, so it's going and you release, all right? That is negative reinforcement. You're applying something negative and it stays negative until the dog performs what it is you're looking for. And then you release the dog from the negative, all right? So negative reinforcement, that's what that is. Does that make sense? All right, so positive punishment, which sounds really bizarre, right? It's like jumbo shrimp. Uh, those two things just don't go together. <laughs> positive punishment. Positive punishment is the act of, of striking, punching, slapping, uh, spanking, um, uh, a correction on the collar uh, with a pinch collar, pinching the skin using the pinch collar. If you are wondering what I'm talking about, go back to our very first uh, discussion, which was yesterday, I think it was, or the day before yesterday, uh, where you give the leash correction. That is positive punishment, right? Sit, dog doesn't sit, bam, you give a straight word up correction on the collar. That's positive punishment. The dog goes, oh crap, I did something wrong. And the dog puts his butt down, good. And now you give positive reinforcement, all right? And so that is now those two things are working together, right? You give positive punishment, again, a very bizarre two words put together. And then the dog gets the correction. The dog then goes, oh crap, I need to sit. The dog sits and now you pet the dog on the head giving positive reinforcement. And then negative punishment is like a timeout. And that is that the dog, you know, you take the dog and you put the dog in the crate, which again, I told you earlier that we've done and it works very effectively, right? So you get negative punishment. All right, so that's a very simplified. It can it can get more complicated than that. So now let's go into operant, or I'm sorry, classical conditioning. Classical conditioning, also known as Pavlovian or respondent conditioning, refers to learning procedure in which biologically potent stimulus, in other words, food, <laughs> I don't know why I have to use such big words, is paired with a previously neutral stimulus, which is a bell. Neutral meaning it was meaningless, right? It was absolutely meaningless, the bell. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and so you put the two things together at the very same time, all right? So uh, just to kind of explain a little bit better, um, you have the bell on the food, you give the dog the food, at the same time he's smelling and tasting the food, you ring the bell, right? You give him the food, as soon as he's smelling and tasting, you ring the bell. 
as soon as he turns, as soon as he rings the bell, you do that over and over again, over and over again. You you marry those two things together, right? Then at some point the dog goes, oh, the bell is equals equals food, that steak, right? So you ring the bell and the dog goes, oh, where's the steak? And the, and the slobber starts coming out and he starts looking around, where the hell's the steak? I heard the bell, it's got to be around here somewhere. So you've married those two things together. What is it we do in detection dogs? That is exactly what we do. I put the toy, as you go back, if you look lower down on our Facebook page here, until you see where I'm doing bed bug detection dog, you look all the way at the beginning, I'm putting the tennis ball and the bed bugs together. The bed bugs being the previously neutral stimulus. It has an odor, but the dog has no care about bed bugs up to that point, right? The tennis ball, potent stimulus for all these dogs because they love their tennis ball. We select dogs that only want that tennis ball. They will die for that tennis ball. You put the potent stimulus with the neutral stimulus and you marry the two things together. The dog's searching, he smells the potent along with the neutral, smells the potent along with the neutral, smells the potent along with the neutral. We begin to reduce the size as is seen in the videos that we do and I cut the tennis ball in half. I cut it in a quarter. I cut the quarter in a quarter. Then I cut that quarter of a quarter in a quarter. And then we get down this little time. And then pretty soon we'd have nothing. The dog smells the bed bugs, which was previously the neutral stimulus, but is now what? What is it? I can't hear you. Nobody's writing it. Potent stimulus. The dog now, the bed bugs become the potent stimulus. The dog smells the bed bugs. He sits, which is what we want him to do uh, through. Um, uh, operant conditioning. We teach the dog to sit separately. We use operant conditioning to get the sit. The dog doesn't sit. We give him a correction. Dog sits. Good. Then we give him a toy. Positive reinforcement. Sit. Dog sits. We give him positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement. So, so we teach the dog to sit. Now we marry classical conditioning with the bed bugs that we created with the uh, uh, operant conditioning of the sit. And now we put those two things together. And now you have a detection dog. Wow. <laughs> how is that for training, right? How is that for teaching uh, operant and classical conditioning in a way that hopefully you understood? Uh, again, my name is Andy Falco Jimenez, and I'm uh, helping you understand these two things. If that made no sense, um, that's fine. I, I hope it did. All right, so, um, so we have all these models. So now we're getting to the point of this particular episode here. What is Falco Canine Academy's philosophy? Which one of those do we use? And quite honestly... We've used just about all of those in our training. I know. And it seems like, you know, well, you guys are on the fence on it. Would you just pick something? Well, no, you can't. You absolutely can't. Now to get to that story that I was talking about, primarily what we use for detection dogs is a toy. We are known, and just like almost every other police dog trainer, uh, detection dog trainer on the planet, other than a couple, we use a toy for the reward. Now, there's a couple uh, that are just sold on this food reward thing. And uh, I, we personally think that it can lead to problems if you don't do it right. And if you're doing it in a way where you have to starve the dog in order to get the dog to respond in a way that you want him to respond, then you're, you're really into trouble. And the dog's now searching under stress. Now, <clears throat> are, those dog, are there dogs that we would train with food? And the answer is absolutely. That is why you can't get stuck on one of these things. You can't. So I got this dog named uh, Lola. Lola comes to us uh, from a, a family. Hello, Kim. Hello, uh, uh, Kendall. Um, and she, uh, Kendall, has a peanut allergy, and it can kill her. She's actually it gets uh, fed uh, through a tube, um, and it's very dangerous. If she smells in the air peanuts, she could die. Right. And so we have this dog that we're given from them, which is not normally how we operate. Right. And say we want this dog to become her peanut dog, and I test the dog. I said, this ain't the greatest dog on the planet. Um, and uh, no, well, uh, I didn't want to. And they said, well, we've already had this other trainer come by and it was a nightmare. And we just, we really want this dog to work. This dog was found in a, uh, a crack house in Compton and uh, has a history and we just need this dog to work. And uh, I go, listen, if you leave here, you may go somewhere and somebody may actually take your money and say that it's possible and that it's going to be a good thing. I said, listen, I'm telling you right now that this is not the best idea. It's not that it wouldn't work necessarily. It's just that you're going to have other issues that are, you know, that may cause you some headaches. Um, and so um, it may not be the best situation. I always look for the best possible. Do all dogs have problems? Yes. Do all dogs end up having hip problems or elbow problems or shoulder problems or whatever? Uh, 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 behavioral problems? Yes. But we like to weigh heavier on the, on the, uh, the types of dogs that are least likely to have that problem because they test well, because they show us they actually kind of meant to do this kind of job. Lola was not that dog. 
but they wanted the dog to work. And I was so afraid. I said, listen, I'm afraid you're going to go somewhere else. And then people are just going to blow a bunch of smoke up your butt and you're going to believe everything I say. So uh, let, let, okay, I will do this for you. I will take the dog and I'll get the dog to a place and I'll show you as where we are and how we're doing it. And we'll take you along for the ride. And at any time you see that it's just not it's something you're interested in, then we'll move on. Anyway. So, um, we again, up getting the dog, uh, you know, at our place, uh, and we were using um, a toy that the dog was responding to and that kind of stuff. And it, at one point, it just came, became very clear that we were going to have to use uh, food and a click, clicker training uh, to get this to even get to a point where it could possibly work. And uh, sure enough, we got it to a point where the dog would detect peanuts. Uh, there's a video on YouTube you can find where I touch peanuts with my hand. Uh, I then uh, go like this with my hands and wipe them off. I go and touch a remote control, just like this one, with my hand at a hotel, and I put it down, right? I don't know how long I waited, maybe 15, 20 minutes. I came on. I bring Lola in. Lola searches. She goes to the remote control, control and sits on camera. And uh, I just go, okay, well, this is where I got. Now, that's all well and good because dogs can sometimes do that in a, in a sterile environment, but now you get them in a, a church where people are walking around or you get them into a movie theater or get them into a ice rink where she was a professional ice skater or on her way to be a professional ice skater or, and now she's a professional singer. And now you have other thing, other stimulus that's going to overcome. And so, but the dog kept getting a little bit better and doing well. The connection between Kendall and the dog were good, but the connection between the dog and her mom were really, really good. And so we we at least got to a point and I said, listen, but there's still, she has other problems, which it's her story to tell. Uh, I've told you enough. Um, and then we get called by National Geographic. National Geographic wants us to come uh, and be in a part of a competition. Want Lola to be the dog that comes in the competition. And uh, what they're going to do is they're going to wipe, peanuts uh, peanut butter onto a plate and on one plate and then 30 or 40 well, so uh, 39 other plates would be clean uh this one would have peanut and they would clean that with a power washer from detroit that is probably the best built power washer on the planet and this show is called uh showdown of the unbeatables so the idea the premise is is that they're going to wash down all the plates including the one with the peanuts so that it's so clean that there's no there's what the uh, the idea was that, that the power washer was so good it was going to wash away any uh, 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 trace of any peanuts on that plate. They lay out all these plates. Uh, part of the competition, the dog searches, the dog sniffs all the plates, and she alerts on the plate. There's an X, and they turn over, and there's the X. The dog found the correct plate. Now, the funny part of that is that we the food and clicker training is not our primary way of training detection dogs. And yet the one thing that we get on television for is the one dog that we do food reward, clicker training. And and so people go, well, there, there you go. And but I'm telling you, we've trained thousands of dogs with a toy. There's that was my long story. I never even got, I should have told that story more at the end. But uh, so there's the thing. And I, I guess it's really to get to the point of the story is that you cannot say that you can't use any of these methods, really, right? The only ones that I don't use are the ones that are dangerous or harmful or inhumane to the dog, right? We want to make sure that we're building the relationship. And so the closest one is number seven, which is this uh, relationship based training which we call uh, training your dog with love and respect. And that's what the name of that paper is training your dog uh, with love and respect. And that is key because it is un not unlike any relationship where if you don't have love and respect, if the dog does not love you and respect you, it is really hard for a dog to follow you, right? You need to have that love and respect. And I often compare it to the Christian religion where you love and respect Jesus or God to the point where they are your leader and you will do anything. You'll hand everything over to them and you should, we don't, but you should obey them and the word, right? The word of God, the word of Jesus. And, and so that is the Christian religion. And again, whether you have to be religious or, or not to understand this, just to understand that's the basis of that religion. And yet God in, loves and respects uh, us enough to, you know, give us the rules, uh, ask us to abide by the rules and we don't, there's a consequence, right? It, it, it go, actually goes both ways, but there actually has to be the the leader, the God in the sense, and the uh, follower, 
right? The congregation or the, you know, the group of people. But in this case, it's the follower, which is the dog. So we, in the sense, are the God and the dog is the follower. But both have love and respect for each other, but in a way that's different, right? The dog loves us in the way that he loves us and respects us and understands that everything in the house is, is the human beings. Everything. The food the dog eats, the water the dog drinks, the bowl the dog eats or drinks out of, the bed the dog uses, the toy the dog, the dog is given as a reward. All of that belongs to the human, but they want to give it back to us because they respect us enough to give it back to us and let go of it. Um, not eat our clothes because those are our clothes, right? Not run out that door because we did not give them permission to go out that door. To come back to us when we call them because that is what is supposed to be done, right? That is relationship-based dog training that is built on love and respect. And that is our training. Now, how do we get there? Is by understanding all these methods. Because some of those methods are not going to work for, uh, uh, you know, like the, uh, the click and treat. Uh, it won't necessarily work on a dog who's attacked, literally attacked somebody else in the household, right? The click and treat, you know, well, we can start with, but no, we want that fixed to today, right? We want it fixed as quickly as possible. Click and treat doesn't necessarily work today, right? So we need to figure out how is it that we can get this relationship back together again by because we have to work on this issue because it's important, especially if it bit the other spouse or something like that, the dog is gone, right? The dog is gonna leave unless we can act quickly and make a difference in this dog's life quickly. Click and treat may not be that way. Could it be? I, I've not seen it, but it's possible. <laughs> you know, it, maybe there is. Electronic collar training, maybe not. Maybe the electronic collar would actually make the problems worse. Is it a pinch collar? Not always. Sometimes the pinch collar can actually now make your problem even like 10 times worse if you don't use it correctly. In many cases, it can make it way better really fast, right? And so by understanding all of these methods, so our method is understanding all the methods and techniques, using relationship-based training of love and respect to get the end result to build a relationship between the human and the dog. That is our, that is Falco Kane and Academy's technique and way of training. That's how it is. It has to be. It should be, a, be that way with everybody. Is it? No. As I've shared in the last video that I did on uh, what collars do we use, is that there's trainers out there that only use a pinch collar. That's so bad and so dangerous and so naive and so stupid, right? Um, uh, using only electronic collar. I think that too. And I have many friends that work at a particular training company that that's the only thing they use. Now, they see great success because they know how to do it well enough that they have enough dogs fit into that parameter, but there's, it, it's, it's just, again, we're, we're talking about something that may not work for everybody. And so if we're going to go to the thing, which um, uh, Austin, oh, Sebastian, I see. Hi. How is the best, how is the best to training a dog? How is the best? Uh, Sebastian, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I think that's what I'm answering. So if you're just joining us, Sebastian, <laughs> I think, uh, start from this from the beginning. When the replay comes up, start from the beginning because that's kind of what I'm talking about. They're, they're, they're all good. I mean, well, yeah, they're all okay. Some of them are great. Some of them are, uh, and we find the one that fits for the dog and the human being. Um, but when we go back to Austin, now I'm gonna get back to Austin. So we go back to Austin's point. Uh, is it about the human? Absolutely. Remember what I said about collars, the collars are selected based on the human being, not selected based on the dog. So if those of you that are joining us and just watching it and you're trying and you're going, I have no idea what he's talking about, go back and watch the one on collars because the collars are not, cho we don't choose the collars based on the dog. We, we choose the collar based on the human being. What collar does the human being need? And now people look at that in a funny way, oh, you put on the dog, on the human? No, it, it, we choose a collar based on who, on who the human being is with the dog that they have. The collar is choose based on the human being is by the dog that they have. The method of training that we decide to use with the hum with the with the with the um, the combination of human and dog is based almost always on the human being and the combination of the dog. Right. So you it, it's it's a very important under, uh, thing that a trainer needs to understand that it really is about this relationship and so much involves the human being and their willingness to become a dog trainer. Now, if they're willing to become a dog trainer and maybe the uh, click and treat is a great way to go with whatever it is they wanna do, they better be ready 
to understand that click and treat takes a little bit of technique and time and it's fantastic it actually gets a lot of things done we can do some stuff that's pretty amazing with click and treat right click and treat doesn't always mean a clicker and food it, 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 there's other things that we can do that is also click and treat but not uh in that same with those same components it's also done a little bit differently um Model training works fantastic. We, again, I've told you, we've done it with other dogs. We've shown another dog doing the thing they're supposed to be doing. And then we have the other dog come close to performing it actually by watching another dog. It happens. Um, positive reinforcement. I told you, I train a police dog almost entirely in positive reinforcement. I cannot think of the times that I actually corrected the dog, but I think withholding something from the dog is not purely positive. I think as we see in the uh, classical conditioning that it's, that it's called negative, <laughs> oh, not, not classical, sorry, operant conditioning. See, I just did it myself. Operant conditioning uh, that you got negative reinforcement, right? Escape. Uh, when the dog and it looks positive, right? It's po I'm positively uh, uh, letting the dog get something once he shows me he's doing it by stopping the negative, right? <laughs> and so, uh, which would be a withholding food, right? I'm, I'm withholding food, which is uh, negative reinforcement, right? And once the dog does it, then I give him the food, right? So if you have a dog that's trying to bite your hand, you're withholding it until the dog stops biting hand and then you give it to him. Right. And so there, there's there's all these things you got to really kind of look at, um, but definitely withholding food, especially in, in days to get a dog to get so hungry that he'll do something right is purely negative and is not positive and harms the relationship and is hard for the dog's psyche and really makes it stressful for the dog. I despise it. That one I despise. All right. Never starve a dog to try to get a result unless unless you have a super aggressive issue, which in case, sometimes removing the water for a day or two, not a day or two, a day, not a day or two, about a day uh, and withholding the, the water to a point until the dog stops growling at you and then give him water, right? Just only holding it until he stops growling at you. Uh, and, but this is an extreme circumstance. And uh, you know, you, you mentioned these things sometimes and in my head, I'm thinking, ah, now somebody's gonna go crazy with it. But I'm telling you, this is an extreme circumstance that if the dog does not stop this aggression, the only solution is euthanasia. That kind of dog, that kind of aggressive, nasty dog that just will not let any human being touch him. If you withhold water for about a day and then come and say, look, I got some water. <laughs> Stop growling at me. I'm going to give you some water. The dog, you can approach and get there without the dog growling. Then you give the dog some water. That dog's attitude can change very well. And we've seen it happen a couple of times. Uh, withholding food, you can withhold food for about a day. Again, on dogs that are super aggressive and it's really bad, right? That may be the one thing that will get you doing it. But I withhold those two things withholding food and water for extreme circumstances where the only alternative of you is euthanasia. If we don't fix it with this, it's the last result or last resort, not last result, last resort. I'm going to use those because if I don't, the only thing we can do is put the dog to sleep and we, and we have to give it a shot for this dog to see. We, so we can say we tried everything. We tried it all. Uh, but this dog was not to be saved. All right. So, whew. I hope I answered all the questions in your head. <laughs> or I hope I at least answered the question of the name of the video. All right, so as to revisit, uh, we have what's called, oh no, where'd it go? I lost it. There it is. It is called the animal wellness, uh, how come it says canine? Oh, online, sorry. Online animal wellness uh, summit. Uh, I put the URL in the uh, comment section. You're either going to see it on the very top, depending on when you're watching this, or at the very bottom. I'll put it in there again, so it's in there more than once. It's free. All right? I just want you to know it's free. Do not be afraid to put your name and email address. The only way that we can get you the information to be on the event uh, and know when to uh, watch the videos and when they're available and when the live broadcasts are going to be uh, 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 broadcast um, is by having your email address so that we can send it to you. And the name allows us to personalize it to you. So copy. So just put your name and email address, sign up for the Animal Wellness Summit. Be there. It's uh, 50 experts, 10 straight days, all online. You don't have to go anywhere. You can watch it from the comfort of your home or at your office at lunchtime, right? You never want to watch this while you're working unless you can. Uh, and it's passion experts. It's gonna it, it it covers horses, dogs, and cats, and um, you're gonna want to be a part of it. It's we're gonna cover a lot of ground. I was talking to uh, the gentleman who's running it uh, yesterday, uh, and we spoke about some very 
uh, important aspects of it, and you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, it. Whether you're a pet owner, if you are a veterinarian, if you are a shelter rescue, if you are a groomer, a dog walker, uh, what else is out there? There's others. If you're in agility, if you're in dog training, if you're in uh, the behavioral whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, you will want to be part of the Animal Wellness Summit. Uh, it's uh, November 10th through the 20th, 10 days, November 10th through the 20th, 2017. It's the first annual online summit. And uh, it looks like it's going to be fantastic. Again, I, I was talking to the gentleman who's putting this all together. He's doing a great job putting this together. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to cover all kinds of stuff, nutrition, uh, essential oils, uh, uh, nutrition, um, uh, uh, care, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about dog training, much like I did today. So you definitely want to be part of it. All right. So that is it. I hope that that wasn't too long for you. How long was I on? We were on... I keep forgetting it doesn't have the total time that we've been on here, but I think I started somewhere after eight, so about 45 minutes. So 45 minutes to explain our, our method of training, not bad, right? It, it shouldn't take probably 45 minutes, but I went into great detail because I wanted to tell you about the other ones. That way you knew if, uh, you know, if you're just, a, it just, if you're a pet dog owner and just like, what are all the, you know, what other methods are there, right? You'll have at least an understanding now somewhat of when you go to a trainer and you say, what methods do you use? Uh, do you build on the relationship or you just simply starve the dog or do you alpha roll or do you uh, punch the dog or, or what do you do? And so it would be important to know that before you get started. It should be about building the relationship through the methods that are necessary to build that relationship, to create love and respect. Anything minus that, if it's hurt in the relationship, you're in the wrong place. Uh, they don't understand what it's going to take to get your dog in, into that place where they love and respect you, then move go to another trainer and get out. We get so many dogs that have been with other trainers. That is kind of one of the things that I, that I, I found out early on is that there are so many dogs that get kicked out of other training places because they the other trainer's scope is so narrow because they only use pinch collars or they only use uh, flat collars or they only use treats. Right. And so they get a dog that's aggressive. They go, well, we don't take aggressive dogs. Well, what good are you, right? <laughs> what kind of training is this if you can't address problems, right? And so they only can take dogs that will uh, comply under whatever narrow training methods that they can use. And so that's why we get so many dogs that get kicked out of other other uh, training locations, especially the big box, uh, what are those called? Uh, big box pet store places. All right, that is it. And also we have any more questions that are gonna pop up here. Uh, Sebastian, Austin, thank you for being brave enough to putting uh, your uh, your information out there. Uh, Sebastian, I hope I answered your question. Uh, it, 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 based on what I can, I think you're trying to ask there is that you uh, just need to watch this from the beginning and I think it'll be a better understanding for you uh, about what it is that I was talking about here in regard to what it is that you're gonna look for in a trainer and the method. The method is really what it is that's gonna be best for you and build that relationship with your dog and it can be, uh, you know, uh, clicker training. It can be uh, a choke chain, a pinch collar. It could be as long as somebody knows how to use it properly, that it builds a relationship and doesn't hurt the relationship. All right. Hope that helps. And I will see you the next one. This is really funny doing this on the Sunday night at nine o'clock. Um, normally, I would be getting ready for uh, Game of Thrones uh, because um, uh, there's going to be a new episode tonight. So we're going to watch that. All right. That is it. I will talk to you later. Take care. Bye-bye.